Hello, everybody, and welcome to the State of Salmon Recovery in the Nisqually Watershed. Thank you so much for spending your evening with us. My name is Emily McCartan. I'm the staff coordinator for the Nisqually River Council, which is one of the hosts of tonight's event, along with the Nisqually Land Trust and the Nisqually Indian Tribe. We've got, uh, looks like, close to 70 people online with us now, and uh, a few more will be trickling in as we get started. I want to just go over a couple of housekeeping items really quickly. This webinar is being recorded, so when it is over and you want to watch it again and share it with all of your friends and family, you will have the ability to do that. We will send out a link when that's available in the next couple of days. Uh, the Q&A will also be part of that recording, so keep your questions to uh, items that you're willing to have potentially shared. Um, the Q&As are open. You'll see those down at the bottom of your screen. There should be a green, um, a green button that says Q&A. Anytime during the panel, you can type a question in. We'll hold those until the end, and then I will relay them to our panelists. You do not need to worry about chat. You do not need to worry about audio. You do not need to worry about your video. All of those things are turned off so that we have, can have a really streamlined um, conversation, and we will get to as many questions as we can uh, by the end of the evening. If you are inspired by today's talk and you want to get involved or learn more about salmon recovery and all of the great work going on here in the Nisqually watershed, you can visit NisqualiLandTrust.org or NisqualiRiver.org. I know there will be some socially distanced volunteer opportunities for small groups to do things like tree plantings throughout this fall, and we'll have a number of other online events coming up in the next few months um, that we would love to see you at. All right, with that, uh, it's my great pleasure to introduce our panelists for tonight. We have David Trout, the Natural Resources Director for the Nisqually Indian Tribe. We have Chris Ellings, the Salmon Recovery Manager for the Nisqually Indian Tribe, and Joe Kane, the Executive Director of the Nisqually Land Trust. So with that, uh, feel free, again, if you have technical questions or questions about uh, what our panelists are talking about, you can put them in that Q&A and uh, I will either respond or put that in the queue for them to answer towards the end of the panel. And with that, I'll turn it over to David. Great, thank you, Emily, and thank you all for being here, aloha. And I can hear I can hear the aloha coming aloha. back from uh, so many of you. Thank you. Um, we're honored to have you all here with us tonight to talk about what's going on in salmon recovery in the Nisqually River. For those of you who don't know me, I am David Trout. I'm the Natural Resources Director for the Nisqually Tribe, and I've been in that position for now 33 years, hired by Billy Frank to work on salmon recovery 33 years ago, and been working on it since, and enjoy every moment of it, and lots of great work, and you're gonna hear about it tonight. I'm the warm up act to the real serious presenters that are coming later. So I'm just gonna sort of set the table and they're really gonna give you the information I'm sure you're all interested in. But um, I'm gonna start, out, start out by talking about why recover salmon? Why are we interested in recovering salmon in the first place? I mean, not only are they just an amazing animal do incredible things and migrate great distances out in the ocean and navigate by the stars and find their way home time and time again, they're, they're just a pretty amazing animal that are a key centerpiece to our ecosystem. And everything <laughs> in my presentation is totally locked up. There we go. Um, everything in our ecosystem that we enjoy and that we see are dependent on salmon, from southern resident killer whales, which depend on the Chinook salmon coming out of the Nisqually River, to bears in the watershed and throughout its uh, migration pattern. Salmon support up to 137 different species in the in their ecosystem from insects and uh, invertebrates to giant mammals like whales and bears. They are the keystone species that connects us all to the ocean. And they do it every year and come back and it's pretty remarkable. And there are lots of things that depend on them. Some things probably depend on them a little bit too much and maybe a, really, a little too many of them, but that's a story for another presentation. Um, lots of other things have uh, grown to become dependent on salmon and economies have been built in the region based around salmon from fishing industries that support commercial fishing to a lot of our local small communities that are really dependent on recreational fishing and all the money that it brings in in tourism over the years and how their economies are so tied to the salmon seasons now that it's really make or break depending on how long the fishing seasons go on. Um, and that's a really good reason to recover salmon. And the connections to bears and whales are a really good reason to recover salmon. But for the folks that I work for, for the last 33 years, I think the most important reason is 
to maintain the connection to the peoples that were here first and over thousands and thousands of years have been with salmon and have evolved with salmon and their cultures and their diets and their religions and all of their traditional beliefs are all tied to the salmon. The Squally tribe doesn't have calendars. Tribal members don't use calendars. They use the fish to tell them when it is at a certain time of the year. And so the salmon are their calendars and they're ultimately intimately connected to it. And their village sites and fishing sites were all based on where the fish were at any given time. And all this was captured leading up to civil or, uh, colonization through the treaties of Medicine Creek to protect that connection between the Nisqually people and the salmon. And the Treaty of Medicine Creek and all of the Stevens treaties negotiated out here had a particular article that was really key for the tribes to protect for their futures. And it was article three around the taking of fish. Um, and although in treaty language, the tribes knew what it meant. And as Billy always said, it, was, it allowed us to be Nisqually Indians forever. And that was the intent behind the treaties. And so the tribes maintained their promises behind the treaties, which, which was to allow peaceful settlement to occur and colonization of the area. And in return, they wanted to continue to be on the Nisqually River and be Nisqually Indians forever. Well, that became challenging as more and more people became dependent on salmon in the region and the resource diminished. My puppy is barking and I'm going to let him out the door. Hang on one sec. The joys of webinars from home. <laughs> so as the resource became more utilized by primarily distant fisheries, there was intense increased pressure in the rivers, and in particular the Nisqually River, to stop tribal fishing, to not honor those treaty rights. This is a picture of Billy Frank when he was a young man fishing on the Nisqually River. And the tensions grew, and, the, and it became known as the fish wars that occurred in the 1960s. And tribal members were arrested and dragged off the river and beaten and tear gassed for fishing, for exercising a treaty right, for trying to maintain the promises that were given to them in a treaty of 1854. And that went on for a period of time. And lot, Billy was arrested over 60 times and a lot of other tribal members spent a lot of time in jail, all ultimately culminating with an event on the Puyallup River where the tribal members were tear gassed and so was the US Attorney General who then decided to take this on to federal court. So in 1974, the infamous uh, decision was, off, was um, offered by Judge Bolt out of the federal district court that interpreted the treaty language to basically say that the tribes have a right to 50% of the resource and also a responsibility and obligation to manage that 50%. And so he also laid out a framework for the tribes to do that and a relationship between the tribes and the state on how to work on salmon management and salmon recovery moving into the future. So a key decision that has withstood numerous federal court challenges and Supreme Court challenges and has come back in favor of upholding the treaty right in a way that respects the tribe's history and culture. And this is a great picture of um, Dorian Sanchez, who was our tribal chair, Billy Frank, Judge Bolt, and George Kalama at Nisqually soon after the Bolt decision was issued. And that really marked the end of the big fish wars, although they're still activities that go on today um, that deal with fish management. And some might say that the fights continue, but the fights are continuing in a different way. And the warriors of the time shifted from being warriors and being arrested to becoming statesmen and trying to find a different model to move forward with. We went from fighting on the riverbanks to talking to our neighbors on the riverbanks and finding collaborative solutions to the issues that faced the Nisqually watershed and salmon. Uh, in 1977, right after the Bolt decision, Billy Frank offered a paper to his community laying a path forward for salmon recovery and for their fishermen. And he started working diligently on that right after that and decided that the path to go forward for us that would be most successful would be a collaborative path, working with our neighbors. This is a great photo of Jim Wilcox and David Berger and, and Billy Frank working collaboratively on some issues around the Wilcox farms. And rather than litigate and fight over these issues, Billy and others in the Nisqually have found a path forward to work collaboratively. And, what, and in doing so, we've had a number of great successes. And Chris is going to talk about some of this, and so will Joe. And we've had great celebration to celebrate this success. And many of you have been there with us on the banks of the Nisqually and in the Delta to celebrate these great events. And 
Billy would always remind us that it's all about our fishermen. It's all about making sure that Nisqually Indians are on the Nisqually River fishing all the time. And that not only fishing, but they're catching fish and have fish to catch. And the story you're gonna to hear tonight is about our work that we're doing to be sure that they do have fish to catch. And the real reward for this is maintaining that connection between generations and staying on the river and fishing in places where your father's fathers fished generations ago. Now things aren't um, as bright as we'd like them to be and you're gonna hear some of that. There is a real sense of urgency around the work that we're all doing from protection and restoration at the tribe and the land trust are working to work that's being done throughout Puget Sound. We're losing the battle to maintain our salmon populations. And I'll give a couple of quick stories to, to illustrate that. In 1987, when I started with the Nisqually Indian tribe, we were fishing eight months out of the year, three days a week, four weeks out of each month. So we basically fished whenever the salmon and steelhead were available. In 2015, we fished eight days. So we went from eight months to eight days. And that's all based on dwindling resource. The fish just aren't as available as they used to be and are crying out for us for our help. Another example that I wanna share with you to illustrate the, the urgency, again, going back to when I started, the Nisqually tribe fished uh, for chum and steelhead in the winter of 1987 and caught 2000 steelhead. And Billy would always say, any fisherman can fish in the summer for Chinook and coho, but you were a real Nisqually fisherman when you fished in the winter for steelhead and chum. That's what really tested your mettle and made you a Nisqually fisherman. And catching steelhead and chum as the last run returning to the Nisqually River is what kept them sustained until the first fish runs of the next season would return. So in 1987, we caught 2,000 steelhead. By 1993, we caught three. And we've had many years since then in the intervening 25 plus years where we've caught none. And in fact, Willie Frank, in the bottom right picture here, has been fishing since he was 15 years old in the Nisqually River, he's now 37, has never caught a steelhead. That to me speaks of the urgency of why we're doing this work and why it's so important to maintain that connection. We're already seeing it being lost in our fishermen. I have a generation of fishermen like Willie who if caught a steelhead wouldn't know what it was in their net because I've never seen one and we need to fix that. And the other reason why it's important for us is the picture on the left is one of our elders, just a smile on his face of catching a fish. It wasn't a particularly good fishing day for him. He only caught a handful of fish, but he was on the Nisqually River catching fish in the spot where his father's father fished generations before. And it made him smile. And it makes me smile. It makes all of us smile. And that's why, in my opinion, why we are involved in salmon recovery. And so with that, Emily, I will turn it over to you to get on to the main acts of this uh, performance. Thanks so much, David, for the introduction. Uh, I'm going to turn it over now to Chris Ellings, the Salmon Recovery Manager for the tribe. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Let me get my uh, presentation teed up. Ah. Nope, not yet. Too Don't much. look. Look away. Don't look. <laughs> Done. I'm usually the one who doesn't have technical difficulties. <laughs> All right. Um, thank you so much for coming, taking time um, out of your busy quarantine to uh, to spend a Thursday evening with us. Um, I think it's really uh, inspiring for us working um, on this topic to know that people are actually really interested in it. Um, we worry all the time about people getting salmon recovery fatigue and kind of just starting to tune it out. And so it's inspiring for us on the ground uh, to know there is a lot of interest um, and the tune in. I wish I could see you all um, and be in a room with you to get some, you know, to have that feedback, that human interaction, which um, I'm sure we're all missing right now. So I'm Chris Ellings. I'm the salmon recovery program manager for the Nisqually Indian Tribe, and I have a total honor to be manage a program whose sole purpose is to um to uh, recover salmon and to plan for their recovery and to do the science necessary to uh, know what the right actions are to recover salmon and to have a full native plant crew that is out there planting hundreds and hundreds of acres um, in native plants and maintaining those plants over time 
We have research biologists and restoration biologists. Um, we coordinate the Nisqually lead entity that um, is responsible for um, funneling projects through a salmon recovery funding cycle. And so um, it's a really great um, position to be in. And we're so, um, we're so blessed to have the Nisqually Indian tribe take this so entirely, so seriously that um, there's a whole program dedicated to it. So um, before we start, just in case there's folks kind of uh, new to the region or from outside the region, um, this is in the Squally River watershed. It's located in South Puget Sound. Um, the Nisqually River starts on Mount Rainier in the Nisqually Glacier and then flows down through the Alder Legrand hydropower complex before then flowing through um, some really actually unique habitats, including this prairie Puget Sound lowland habitat, and then out through the um, Nisqually Delta, which is terminates at the Billy Frank Jr. Nisqually National Wildlife Refuge. So it's a watershed that has its headwaters in a national park and its estuary in a national wildlife refuge, which is um, really unique. Um, before we get into kind of the nuts and bolts of some of our recovery efforts, um, I apologize for the graininess of this, but let's start with a basic salmon life cycle. Um, you know, I've had the pleasure to uh, go to, before COVID, um, go to my kids' class and go over the salmon, salmon life cycle. And it's always fun to uh, be in a room and we I have a bunch of stuffed animals to do it. Um, but this time I had to uh, steal a, a diagram from somewhere else. Um, let's start, you always wonder, do we start with the chicken or the egg? We'll start with the egg in this diagram. So salmon eggs are um, deposited in gravel in the river. When they hatch, they become these little alevins where the, um, their yolk sac is actually still attached to their body. Then after they absorb the yolk from the egg, they become fry, free swimming fry, living in the stream, um, eating small insects and invertebrates. And then as they grow, depending on the species, they move into the estuary where they continue to grow more and make the um, incredibly like taxing uh, transition from being a freshwater animal to a saltwater animal. It completely re rewires their physiology. And then for Puget Sound salmon, they migrate through Puget Sound and um, continue to grow and grow and grow. And that's kind of the name of the game as salmon move out to the Pacific Ocean where they accumulate um, more than 95% of their body mass um, out at sea. And so what this does is you have a bunch of salmon going out to sea, putting on a bunch of body mass, bunch of nutrients that they're acquiring from the North Pacific and then returning as adults back to the rivers of their birth, spawning, um, and in the case of um, most of our salmon species, dying after spawning and depositing these nutrients that they acquired out at sea into our actually very nutrient poor um, glacial systems. Um, in fact, um, there's a lot of evidence that suggests that salmon actually laid the foundation for um, the growth of many of our riparian forests um, and forests along the rivers after the glaciers receded about 30,000 years ago with the nutrients that they brought from the North Pacific. So in the Nisqually, um, as David mentioned earlier, um, historically, Nisqually salmon, the various species, were running the entire year. All year long, there was some um, species of salmon, fresh salmon moving in from the ocean. And we're in a completely different situation now. Our natal, our, our natural um, wild uh, Nisqually, both spring Chinook and fall Chinook, are totally gone. They're extirpated, which is, me, means locally extinct. Um, so currently our fall Chinook population in the Nisqually um, is derived from hatch a hatchery stock um, from the Green River from up north. Um, and that stock along with 
other the other Puget Sound Chinook stocks is are listed as threatened under the um, Federal Endangered Species Act. Our winter steelhead, um, which David mentioned, uh, alluded to the dire condition of this population, is also listed as threatened under the Endangered Species Act. We have a very unique population of Nisqually winter chum, which has evolved to utilize those prairie streams that I mentioned before. And they're the latest returning chum, um, other than like the Yukon um, in the Pacific Rim. And these winter chum are totally special to the Nisqually. They have a very high fat content. They're beautiful fish um, and incredibly important to the Nisqually Indian tribe. Well, they've been declining over the last 15 years um, for several reasons, but uh, we're, that's one that we're still investigating. Um, the native fall chum um, was most likely extirpated. And a lot of these extirpations occurred during the first wave of hydroelectric development on the river um, before uh, minimum flows and other regulations prevented the um, facilities from actually drying up whole reaches of the Nisqually River. Um, luckily, we've been able to overcome a lot of those and um, now have uh, flow requirements that are much more conducive to, um, to salmon. Um, and then we have a coho population where um, we don't have a lot of great uh, adult counts on these coho, but we know that from a Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife smolt trap where they collect the juveniles that are moving out to sea, that it's, they seem to be pretty stable and robust. Um, we hope to learn more about that population through monitoring over time. And then we have another unique, we have a lot of unique populations in the Nisqually. A lot of it has to do with our um, geography where we're located in deep South Puget Sound being the largest river south of the Tacoma Narrows. The pink salmon that return in the Nisqually are also unique. Um, they, are, they return on odd years, and they're two years old, um, when they're two years old, and they have a highly variable run sizes from just several thousand to at one point we had a run close to a million fish. And then coastal cutthroat trout, oh, I love cutthroat, I did my thesis research on cutthroat, but um, we don't dedicate a lot of resources to monitoring cutthroat trout. Um, we think they're doing pretty, pretty good in the Nisqually just from um, observations, but we don't have a dedicated program to looking at them. So anyone who spent a lot of time in salmon country um, and talking to elders and, and folks who have been around a long time, they always talk about the time that you could walk on the back of salmon across a river. Um, those, those times happen occasionally. This was a run of our Nisqually winter chum in 2001 or two, I can't remember the, exactly the year, on Yelm Creek. Um, and you could literally walk on the backs of these salmon. In fact, the carcasses were piled so high they were creating dams for the other salmon coming up. And um, you can see the backs of salmon just trailing up. It was one of the more incredible um, runs I've ever seen. Um, this side of Alaska, and uh, it was something spectacular. We haven't seen this since 2001. So for the purposes of this um, discussion and because of our time limitations, I'm gonna focus primarily on um, our two uh, ESA listed species. So the Nisqually Chinook and Nisqually Winter Steelhead. Um, our Nisqually Chinook, as I mentioned before, the native Nisqually Spring and Fall Chinook were extirpated. Um, they're no longer with us. We currently have a Fall Chinook population that is derived from the Green River hatchery stock. Um, these Green River fish do uh, stray and um, are able to produce naturally in the river and primarily spawn in the Nisqually River main stem, as well as some of the larger tributaries like the Michelle River and Ohop Creek. They spawn in the fall. And as I mentioned, they're listed as threatened under the Endangered Species Act. So we dedicate a lot of resources to trying to recover these fish. And here's one of them. Now our goal, our overarching goal in our recovery plan is to um, recover these fish, not just as museum pieces, where they can continue to support themselves 
but not support uh, our tribal fishery or even non-tribal fisheries, or to support things like so Southern resident killer whale recovery. We want these fish to be um, viable and self-sustaining. Our goal is to develop a locally adapted stock, meaning recover what was lost, that those extirpated uh, Nisqually Chinook salmon that we no longer have. We hope to um, have this Green River population re-naturalize. Um, basically, I sometimes I refer to it as like we we have a domesticated like a lab or German Shepherd right now, and we need to turn this German Shepherd back into a wolf. And in order to do that, we have to expose it to the environment, and we have to let it reproduce with it um, over time and and become adapted to the Nisqually River. And again, um, this is a general theme throughout Nisqually recovery is that we have recovery targets for these fish. We also have a harvest um, goals for these fish. We want the Nisqually Indian tribe to still have a very meaningful connection to their fishery. So our harvest goal for Nisqually Fall Chinook, um, once we're done with recovery and everything's up and running and screaming, and we have hatchery Chinook and, and natural Chinook and is 10,000 to 15,000 fish. Now we have a long ways to go. This is just a, um, don't get caught up on the numbers too much. What we wanna do is look at what the model capacity of our system is. Basically like given the environment that we're starting with, our starting our recovery efforts with um, back in the early 2000s, what can that environment really support if we did have this locally adapted stock? And so we're looking at somewhere between like 6,000 adults, it could probably support. But then when we look at like all the different habitat degradation that has occurred and um, the changes to the landscape, what did that historic landscape, what, what could that support? And that's where we get over here where we have over around 20,000 fish, we think, um, Big wild Nisqually Chinook is what we think that this system under a full restoration scenario um, could support. Now, what's our current escapement? Well, we're a long ways from getting to approximately 20,000 big natural Chinook. Um, since about 2004, we've hovered around 2,000 um, adult Nisqually Chinook um, coming back to spawn in nature. And the vast majority of those through this period have been hatchery origin fish that have um, just been strays into the wild spawning areas. And so we have a real deficit to work with. A lot of this is from the habitat and a lot of this also is with the stock that we're dealing with. And we're trying to rewild that wolf to get to that wolf over time where we can see those fish actually take advantage of the habitat. And in order to do that, we've laid out a recovery framework that marches us through different phases of recovery. And this is a phased approach that will take many, many decades to get through. Um, and right now we're starting with the colonization. Basically we had a degraded environment and we've been working so hard and I'll talk about some of the different successes we've had in habitat and then Joe will dive even deeper but we've worked to um, recover a lot of this degraded habitat, make it now available for these fish. And then our, our objectives right now during this time is to repopulate that habitat, get these fish up there, get the eggs in the gravel and start that life cycle as much as possible. And then as those fish start to respond to the habitat work that we have been doing, we can move into a phase called local adaptation. And that's where we really start to um, take actions to minimize the influence of the hatchery on these natural, on these fish spawning so that we can really start to rewild the population. And then as those fish respond to the, um, the newly restored habitat and the um, lack of hatchery influence, we ultimately will get to a viable population um, that can then be self-sustaining, locally adapted through time and resilient to things like climate change and other um, disturbances in nature. Now, let me contrast that with our other listed species, the Nisqually steelhead. 
Nisqually steelhead are still all wild. The Nisqually steelhead swimming in the river now are the same ones that Nisqually Indian tribal fishermen caught thousands of years ago. There's been very little hatchery influence over the last hundred years. Um, and they spawn in the same areas as Chinook, but even further up into the tributaries and also take advantage of these unique prairie systems. Nisqually wild um, steelhead is kind of a, um, is a scientifically interesting story, but also just a real head scratcher. The Nisqually River was incredibly productive for steelhead for a long, long time. Um, the abundances back to the river matched even the mighty Skagit up north at times, and it provided a really robust um, both tribal and, and sport recreational fishery in the river right up until the late 80s, early 90s, and the bottom just dropped out. Now, the bottom dropped out of almost every steelhead population on the, on the Washington coast, the Columbia River, and the rest of Puget Sound. But as some of the other regions have started to recover from the bottom dropping out, those rivers, especially in South Puget Sound, like the Nisqually, remained incredibly depressed, where at times we've only had escapements, of a couple hundred fish. Um, we've now leveled off to around 1,200 to 2,000. But it's a real, um, there's something now that uh, has been keeping these fish um, from rebounding. So we started doing a lot of research to answer, to try to determine what this is. And we tagged a lot of these small, um, juvenile steelhead that are leaving Puget Sound. And if any of you guys, if any of you have played that uh, Survive the Sound game from Long Live the Kings, this is what it's based on. Um, it's actual tag data that um, you can pick up. And if you look at these pie charts, you can see this like Pac-Man chomping down. Well, that's the survival of these fish as they move out, where we see only about four to 18% of our steelhead actually make it out of um, the Straits of Juan de Fuca. And they migrate extremely fast, just over 14 days to try to make it out. So something is killing these fish in Puget Sound. And we've been doing a lot of research to try to figure out exactly what that is. And a lot of it points to um, our friends, the harbor seals um, and other predators that have gone um, a long time now without any kind of management. So we're working to try to figure this out in a little bit more detail. And um, we can't catch Nisqually steelhead now. Whether you're a travel member or a sport fisherman, it's very rare to see a Nisqually steelhead. But we have installed a, a counter camera on the Centralia Diversion Dam fish ladder so when a fish comes, swims through the camera, the camera turns on. So now we can all, um, through uh, modern technology, be able to see ah, the elusive uh, this wild Nisqually steelhead. And they're beautiful. So um, the Nisqually steelhead recovery, uh, one of the things that we're in um, Nisqually Chinook recovery, we're really trying to re rewild what is ultimately a hatchery population, turn it into a wolf. Nisqually winter steelhead, we have the wolf. And we need to give that wolf enough um, opportunity to rebound and take advantage of the habitat work that we've been doing. Um, and we've really, and, and to, in a way that um, they can be resilient through time, um, survive uh, any fluctuations in their habitat, whether it be fire or floods, and to support um, fishing again. Now, they're very different recovery cases, but they're all tied to one thing, one common thing threads through all of our recovery actions, and that's habitat. So what my program has done is we've, we've put together recovery plans for both species. 
And now we're, um, we've crosswalked those two recovery plans based on the needs of both animals. And this is just an example, um, looking at how each recovery initiative or habitat initiative um, that we wanna get done and how those influence the different, what we call the VSP parameters or viable salmon population parameters. Whether it's the abundance of those fish as adults, their diversity throughout the system, their life history diversity, and their productivity. Um, and we've graded them all out between Chinook and Steelhead and come out with a prioritized list of um, initiatives, large habitat initiatives, which guide all of our habitat work. We've also created a way to track the implementation of this over time, which um, is an incredibly important part of everything we do, um, whether we're reporting to uh, um, someone in Congress or the state legislature or the Nisqually Indian Tribal Council. We wanna be able to say that with, with, with um, certainty how many acres we've recovered how many different metrics re 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 that we've recovered that are important to these animals. And this is just a table of all of our habitat initiatives tiered in the four big bin bins. And within each initiative, there's a bunch of different separate projects um, that make up an initiative. And when I say we, I wanna take a second to acknowledge that I'll start to say we a lot. <laughs> as we move through the different, some of the different habitat successes. And it really does take a village to, to get all this work done. We have an amazing partnership group um, here in the Nisqually watershed. Um, we have the least contentious um, salmon recovery funding cycle of any watershed in Puget Sound. We all come to agreement on what is the most important thing to do for fish. And we all work together to get it done and, and um, partner frequently in all these big projects. So let's start with our biggest project to date to highlight. Many of you are aware of this project. This is the historic Nisqually Delta. It had miles and miles of, of tidal channels and a whole mosaic of different salt marshes and riparian forests. This is not the Nisqually Delta, this is Commencement Bay, but, and we are so fortunate that our Nisqually Delta did not turn into another Commencement Bay. It was close. There were some incredibly, um, there's a lot of interest in the developing the Nisqually Delta as a deep water port. And luckily there was a gra grassroots citizens stopped this from happening. And they're all heroes in my book. That doesn't mean the Nisqually Delta didn't escape development. Um, it was developed for agriculture. Um, flat land was in short supply as people developed for agriculture. And, the, and um, it was found that if you could keep the salt water out, you could kind of farm or at least graze cows on the, um, the Delta after you keep the tides out. And so this was the diking of the Nisqually Delta. Now in our recovery work, we recognize right away that um, the future of the Squally Salmon recovery really, we really needed to um, remove those dikes and restore what I, you can almost see is the heart of the Nisqually habitat. It's like a bunch of veins and stuff going through it. <laughs> but uh, so we started really early working on both sides of the Nisqually River. Um, to um, over several phases to re restore the Nisqually Delta. Culminating in 2009, with the first tides to come into the restored 760 acres at the Billy Frank Jr. National Wildlife Refuge. And that was an amazing moment. I feel really blessed to have been, been a part of that. That restoration project in and of itself resulted in over 21 miles of new tidal channels restored. All of it is productive habitat for juvenile salmon that are putting on that last stage of growth before they move, move out to Puget Sound. Um, we've done a lot of work to research the impacts of this, but nothing can tell it quite 
like a good old aerial photo analysis. And we can see in the 50s before the um, National Wildlife Refuge became established, the bottomlands were all agriculture and grassland. And the Nisqually actual functional habitat was quite limited. Then as in this, when the Nisqually National Wildlife Refuge was established and the um, inside the dike was managed for freshwater wetlands, these are all managed wetlands that were managed for waterfowl. And then in 2015, after the 2009 restoration and all of our restorations on the other side of the river, you can start to see a way more complex mosaic of different emergent marshes and uh, riparian forests and mud flats starting to develop. So we're, we've reclaimed much of that historic habitat and there's still a lot more to be done on the other side of I-5. Now, there's a, the Nisqually River is situated between two um, rapidly expanding urban areas, the Olympia Lacey Tumwater area and Tacoma. And that puts a tremendous amount of development pressure on the land surrounding the Nisqually River. Um, luckily, we still have a lot of functional, um, terrific habitat along the Nisqually River main stem. And so protecting this habitat is a number one priority. We have almost 80% of the river protected and protective ownership, and we hope to get to 90%. Um, Joe Kane will talk more about some of these and some of the specific projects in a little bit. Another one of our projects that has been um, ongoing for uh, several decades now and um, continues to work, to, continues to be ongoing, is the restoration of Ohop Creek. Ohop Creek was ditched over much of its length. Um, to make way for agriculture in this beautiful wide glaciated valley. And we've been working to restore it and rewild it and re-meander it. And I'll show you a really cool drone image of one of our last projects just after it was, it was, ah, just after it was restored. Um, over here is where the old ditch was, where old Ohop Creek was. And we literally removed, plugged that ditch and carved out a new channel. All these little tubes are plantings um, that volunteers as well as our um, Nisqually Indian Tribe native plant crew planted thousands and thousands of plants. And this is in its raw state, um, pretty much immediately after restoration. So it still has a lot of maturation to do before it becomes a habitat that we wanna see. But um, we did do an earlier phase um, with plantings and you can see how cool it is now as these willows and other plants have grown up in this earlier phase and you start to get shading over the creek and here's a beaver dam on a little side channel. All of these um, habitats provide amazing areas for these juvenile salmon to grow um, and thrive and survive and escape predation and put on the growth necessary for their downstream migration and ultimate survival as adults. Now the Michelle River, our largest tributary, um, was impacted, it flows off of some of the Cascade foothills and it was impacted heavily and is still impacted heavily by industrial logging. It's a great place to grow trees and people took advantage of it. Well, one of the impacts of logging out all these mature large trees is that it leaves very little wood um, to fall into the river. And in the Northwest, in these forested areas, large trees are what really shapes a river and shapes its ability to um, support salmon. So we've been going through and putting in these engineered log jams. Now we consider these engineered log jams to be somewhat band-aids because we need to restore those natural processes and those riparian forests that provide these large trees um, naturally. But when you go to the, the Michelle River now, um, because there's such a lack of large wood in the stream, um, you really see where we have these engineered log jams is where we have these deep pools. And these deep pools provide a incredibly important habitat under both high flows for fish to escape high flows and in summer low flow it becomes a place where that's only deep cold water that these fish can spend the summer in 
It also has added benefit of on these pool habitats, what's called the tail out of the pool, where it shallows up, is the preferred area for steelhead and Chinook to spawn as adults. And when you go into one of these pools in the middle of summer, it's like swimming on a tropical reef. There are fish everywhere. These are all juvenile coho salmon. Now, in order to address some of these failed uh, processes and recover some of these riparian forests and these large trees, um, the collective we have uh, started the Community Forest Initiative. And Joe will dive deeper into this really exciting, groundbreaking project um, that, that will go a long ways to recovering some of these lost habitats. Now, um, I've talked a little bit about some of the successes of our habitat work and I'm almost done. But one of the things that we're constantly doing too is the research and monitoring necessary to determine whether or not we're being successful or not and to guide um, the future actions. And this is what we call adaptive management. Um, we're starting from a place of um, limited knowledge. We're starting from a place knowing that we will always learn more and that you can always learn more. And our understanding right now is imperfect. And I think if you start from that place, you can set yourself up to succeed by um, always having programs in place to learn and to teach and to guide your future decisions. And so we're constantly monitoring everything from adult salmon to juvenile salmon out in the estuary and in the near shore of Puget Sound to also looking at those habitat metrics and determining where we are in the implementation of our, our, of our um, of our plans. And one last thought, um, David and I were out at CQ Washington, out at the Straits of, uh, mouth of the Straits of Juan de Fuca. And I was, you end up bobbing around for hours and hours and hours out there chasing after Hatchery Chinook, your one keeper. And um, one thought that I had to, and is that, you know, we always think of the Nisqually River flowing from Mount Rainier to the Billy Frank Jr. National Wildlife Refuge. But that's just a start. Um, these fish enter Puget Sound and deep South Sound where that star is and have to swim through the entire Sal the US portion of the Salish Sea at least twice. And we also know from our research that as juvenile fish, they mill around and go into different inlets. And so they spend a lot of time, some of them way more time in Puget Sound than they even do in the Nisqually River. And so our recovery, the recovery of our salmon will always be linked to the recovery of the greater Puget Sound Salish Sea ecosystem. And that's one of the reasons why um, David and I and our tribal council and Joe and others spend so much time out of our watershed, making partnerships, um, talking to regulators, talking to others, trying to get all of Puget Sound recovered. And this is one of the reasons why. You look, if you spent time on Puget Sound, boating around, you see this kind of stuff. Rock, riprap, bad habitat. These are areas where, what we call sinks, where the fish are searching these small lagoons and other habitats and encounter a, a harmful environment um, where they experience a lot of mortality and don't get the food they need and the refuge they need. And I had to bleep out some graffiti here. So, cause it's a family friendly event. All right, and with that, I'm done. Thank you so much for your patience. And I hope, um, hope that was entertaining. Thank you. Wish I could see you all. <laughs> Thank you, Chris. Awesome. Um, we're starting to see a few questions pop up in the chat box. I'm going to turn it over to Joe. We will, our panelists have uh, have said that they're available to keep going past 6.30, so we will keep the Q&A going for a little bit. We would love to get your questions. You can feel free to start putting those into the Q&A now, and we will uh, start getting to those uh, as soon as Joe is uh, has presented on the what the Nisqually Land Trust is doing to help uh, help bring back the habitat that Chris mentioned is so critical for our fish. <clears throat> okay, am I on, am I on now, Em? You're on. It's you. I'm on. Okay, I'm going to share a screen, folks. I'll I'll 
talk quickly and um, jump right in here if we can. There we go. That should do it. Good. Hey, and are we up and broadcasting? Looks good. Okay, great. And and um, I'll, I'll preface this by saying we've got a weak internet connection here at home. I may get bounced. If everybody can stand by, if I do, I'll jump back in. It's already happened once in the last hour. Um, okay, Nisqually Land Trust were founded uh, in 1989 right out of the uh, Nisqually Indian Tribes Department of Natural Resources as the Habitat Protection Wing of the Salmon Recovery Program. As Chris has pointed out, habitat protection is the number one priority in the Salmon Recovery Program, and that's what we were created to do, to acquire the habitat. So we've been here for 31 years. We've got about 7,000 acres that we own outright. Um, we That's our preferred means of uh, manner approach to conservation is to own it so we can assure the highest habitat integrity. And we are nationally accredited. Just a quick slide that shows the growth of the land trust. You'll notice this last 15 years, our land holdings really accelerated. And by no coincidence, that's because right here, we professionalized staff. We went from an all volunteer organization to a paid uh, staff organization and really took off from there. As I said, we own 7,000 acres outright. We've got about 300 under easement and another 300 that we've acquired and then transferred almost all of that over to the Nisqually tribe. Um, as with everybody in the salmon recovery program, we work in mainly four areas, the marine area, the estuary and the Nisqually Aquatic Reserve. The main stem of the Nisqually, that lower 42 miles below the Grand Dam, that is the anadromous zone, the salmon producing zone of the main stem of the Nisqually River. The Michelle River and Busy Wild Creek, that's our steelhead lifeline, the pipeline lifeline for steelhead. And then Ohop Creek, um, what Chris has just shown you those wonderful images of. We actually only started our work out in the marine area really intensively about three years ago in support of the Nisqually Aquatic Reserve, which is the shaded area on your screen, which in turn supports the refuge and the estuary restoration. Um, but talking with our partners in the watershed, the tribe principally said, boy, could you bring what you do in the freshwater system out into the marine system? Our board studied it for two years and then said, yes, that's what we're gonna do. We started our first purchase was in 2018, 72 acres on South Oro Bay, Anderson Island, right across from the Squally Delta, one of the first places our fish go when they come out of the Delta. Um, 2019, we won $3.2 million for new projects in a national competition, 22 awards were given out, we got two of them. 2020, we've won another uh, big grant award, so we're working very hard and we'll continue to do so out in the marine area. This year and next year, we should protect two to three miles of undeveloped Puget Sound shoreline with important habitat, both for salmon and for orca. On the main stem, here's an illustration of what we do. We work in a different way on the main stem. On the main stem of the Nisqually, we have many partners who have acquired large blocks of habitat. As Chris said, we have now almost 80% of the main stem Nisqually under permanent conservation status. Um, when the salmon recovery uh, program started many years ago, we were at 3%, set a goal for 90%. We're at almost 80% now. And the land trust really tries to link those blocks by coming in and acquiring uh, lands that have not been protected yet. You see one big in the 16 miles below the Grand Dam coming down all the way through here, we're almost entirely protected. We've acquired this property here in 2019, and we're now working, even as we speak, on closing this gap here. It's in the Wilcox Reach, one of the major reaches on the Nisqually watershed, and perhaps the most dynamic reach on the Nisqually watershed. The river really moves through the, through the Wilcox Reach. It provides spawning and rearing habitat for all five species of salmon native to the uh, Nisqually watershed. It is uh, like the entirety of the main stem, federal critical habitat, designated federal critical habitat for Chinook and Steelhead, both of which are listed under the Endangered Species Act. And the main stem in the Squally is designated by the State Department of Fish and Wildlife as a wild steelhead gene bank. Um, and in the, in the Wilcox reach, all this stuff really comes home. Don't try to interpret this chart. It's just a way of showing from the, uh, the tribe's salmon recovery, steelhead salmon recovery plan. Um, the rating of the Wilcox Reach. Um, we're in the, we're showing the priorities throughout the watershed and it is top priority. So that becomes our top priority. That's what we do. That's, we implement uh, the habitat protection component of the salmon recovery program. And the Wilcox Reach, 
you'll find 11 of the 12 salmonid life stages occur in the Wilcox Reach, the 12th life stage being a marine life stage. And degradation of habitat and water quality and quantity are the deadly threats that we're trying to hold off. Um, they're especially deadly to egg incubation, one of the most important life stages. Here's what a protection project looks like. Uh, we have these two parcels. With luck, hands crossed, we started on this project here, acquiring this 20 years ago. With luck, we will close this by the end of this month. Here's Wilcox Farms. The Wilcox family has been a great partner in this project, working out negotiations with the landowner of this property. It's 174 acres, most of it in the Nisqually floodplain. And it has almost a mile of unprotected but undeveloped Nisqually River main stem shoreline. It's the longest run of unprotected, undeveloped shoreline in the system left right now. And across from it, a 21 acre piece on the other side of the Wilcox Reach that would be joined to our protected areas on the side of the river. And I'll show you what that looks like up close. Here is that 174 acre property with a mile of shoreline. All of this shoreline has been created over the last 40 years as the river moves back and forth across the Wilcox Reach. Directly across from this property is the other property on the south side. Here's the property itself is here. Many of you will recall the story of the military family, the Carr family that um, three or four winters ago lost their home to the Nisqually River. When the Nisqually River here in the Wilcox Reach ate up 160 horizontal feet, horizontal feet of bank and undermined the house. And they had, they did that, the river did that in three months. The Carr family had to abandon the house. The house had to be uh, torn down. It was falling in the river um, even as the demolition was going on. Uh, we wound up with that property. Um, and we bought the property next door from Bill Camp and uh, husband and wife, Bill Camp and Sandra Lippincott. Bill, a Vietnam uh, veteran, um, suffering from the ravages of Agent Orange. We purchased a life estate from Bill and Sandy in which they could live in that house as long as they wanted to. We owned it. And when they left, we would then demolish the house. They moved out two weeks ago. So we've started demolition on the house here. The well is already going in the river right here. There's a septic system back here. So we wanna get that out and we wanna remove development rights from this property here. This is not an area that should ever been uh, developed re residentially. We want it to return to habitat. And it is good habitat in the target property. You still see a beautiful intact riparian forest. Um, and you see a six ap acre upland on the property. Here's the riparian forest, here's the wetland. We'll restore this, we'll reforest, we'll plant native species here um, to restore this habitat in partnership with the tribes, native plant restoration crew as our partner on almost all the restoration projects we do. And also with a lot of volunteers and students. And this is one of those places where salmon recovery really becomes a, one of those community activities where people become part of the salmon recovery project in the Nisqually. In the 2019, we had over 400 volunteers for planting, and these are all native plants planted on a floodplain property. We had over uh, 900 students and their teachers in partnership with the Nisqually Education uh, Project, which is part of the Nisqually River Foundation, come out and use our properties as outdoor classrooms, um, uh, planting, throwing fish carcasses, all those things. But that restoration component is where we really bring volunteers and citizens in and make them really part and make SAM recovery, a community activity across the, across the watershed. Um, another major area of work is the OHOP Valley. Chris showed you beautiful shots of the OHOP restoration. Our job there was to acquire all of that land. Um, we still own it. Uh, we're still the land manager. Um, we, uh, our next phase in the OHOP restoration is to buy more land upstream of that restoration and get ready for the next restoration project. It took us 15 years to acquire the land for the first restoration project. So we move on this, even though we don't know when this project will take place. And our fourth work area is the Michelle, Michelle River and its headwaters, Busy Wild Creek. And Chris has illustrated what's going on in the Michelle. Here is our, where we've really been working hard the last five years. This is the community forest project. We've done land acquisition all along the Michelle, but we have really concentrated there in the uh, high timberlands for reasons I'll show you right now. Here's the Michelle during the drought. This is just below Eatonville. Um, lethal temperatures, too high for fish to spawn, lethal low flow. How does a fish get upstream in this kind of situation? This is the developing situation in the Michelle watershed uh, subbasin. 
as climate changes and as conditions continue to deteriorate. And as Chris said, we have uh, the Michelle is an industrial logging zone. Here's Busy Wild Creek. Um, you can see this. And this shot is about three, three years old. Um, the Michelle has been really intensively logged, especially over the last 10 to 15 years with uh, increased exports to Asia of Northwest timber. What we want to see is, and this is, there's, this is all legal. This is not, this is just forest practices. This is the way it's done. But what we'd really like to see is these areas, especially um, reforested and the stands allowed to age. We've learned that Trees, uh, older trees, 80, 100 years old even, control stream flow much better than a 30 or 40 year old tree. And that if we can reforest even these riparian areas and keep the stands growing longer, we'll get much more water in the stream at the key spawning times of the year. So that's become our big project. And steelhead, unlike Chinook, steelhead are such a big landscape fish. They go into the mountains. So a 150 foot or 200 foot setback off the river for shade doesn't really work in steelhead country. You need to protect those big slopes. So our community forest project targeted doing just that. Um, here is the community forest, our first phase, which we finished last year, paying off the last half million dollars uh, that we had borrowed for it. We, we accomplished these purchases, that's Busy Wild Creek, and we uh, built the, the community forest in three stages over three years, cost almost $10 million in funding from at the county, state, federal, and private levels. Um, but we completed the first community forest in Puget Sound and the second one in the state. Um, and it does not, mean, does not mean the end of logging. Um, what we are doing in the community forest is just changing the way the land is managed. You can see the before photo. This was old industrial timber land that had been clear cut um, and then allowed to uh, naturally regenerate and it did so in a very stunted fashion. The trees were short and skinny. There's, you'll notice no undergrowth going on here. And so what we're doing is going in and thinning from below with our, uh, with Northwest Natural Resource Group, our forest managers. You can see this is the aftershot after a logging operation. You can see things opening up. We've left a lot of stuff on the ground and we'll get an understory going there. And these trees will get older, faster and bigger and do the work of stream flow regulation and carbon sequestration sooner. And at the same time, we're providing steady jobs. Uh, the Scarcella family based out of Buckley and Ashford are our contract loggers. Um, we've got two generations working up there even today as we speak. We've got contracts with them. They have long-term steady work. Um, we're putting, bumped, pumped a lot of money into the uh, local Ashford economy through both the logging and the road repair. Tim Surface, our contractor in Ashford, our road contractor, he maintains the roads we use and he takes out the roads that we no longer use so that we can restore them. The community forest and the land trust holdings up in this area also provide the, the most popular trail, the Mount Toma Trails Association's cross country hut to hut ski trail, uh, the biggest no fee trail in the country. It gets over 5,000 users a year, a big economic driver in Ashford. And I put this in here so you can see the connection between salmon recovery, and salmon, and cross-country skiing. And the bigger picture is that salmon recovery is a community builder, it's a community forest, it's about fish, and it's about a whole bunch of other stuff. The point David was making that when you bring salmon back, you bring your local communities back, you bring your local cultures back, you bring your local economies back, and you bring people back in touch with the land. And that's what salmon recovery is. And that's it. Back to you, Em. Thanks so much, Joe. And thank you so much to all of our panelists, Chris, David, and Joe. We really appreciate having you uh, share all of this awesome work that you're doing. We would give you a round of applause. Everybody feel free to just applaud at your computer. I'm sorry <laughs> that you can't hear that coming from everybody. Okay, I'm going to bring this up to speaker view so you can see all of us. Um, we have a couple of questions. David's been all over answering questions in the <laughs> chat. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, but we have a couple that I think would be good to hear uh, you talk a little bit more about. Uh, first uh, question from Chris Barnes, who's a council member from DuPont. Thank you so much for being here. Um, and DuPont is obviously one of the first stops for Nisqually salmon as they <laughs> migrate out, of, out into Puget Sound. What, uh, what can those coastal communities in the Sound do to help support salmon as they make their way out to the ocean? Let me, uh, if you don't mind, Chris, I'll start on that one, and you, you may have um, some gaps that I'll leave to fill. 
Um, first, Council Member Barnes, welcome. It's great to meet you sort of through this webinar. Um, I was a long-term resident of DuPont and it has a special place in my heart. It's a great community, so thank you for being here. Um, I think there are a number of things that you can do and your community can do to be helpful. Uh, as Chris pointed out, our fish are swimming through Puget Sound and go by your DuPont shoreline twice in their li life histories, once as juveniles going out and once as adults coming back. Protecting that shoreline is gonna be absolutely critical. I know it's currently protected, but there's always pressures to change these things. And so maintaining those protections of that shoreline is absolutely vital. And then I know that there's a plan to restore Sequoia Creek that is making its way through the system and probably is in front of you or soon will be in front of you. And supporting the restoration of Sequoia Creek is gonna be critically important. Salmon need as much habitat as we can get. Our Chinook are looking for other estuaries to rear in besides ours. And if we could restore the Sequoia Creek estuary, it'd be a tremendous benefit to the squally fish. And then I would also say that you and your citizens at DuPont could be more active in terms of supporting state and federal funding for the work that we're doing. I had the privilege of spending 15 years on the Salmon Recovery Funding Board, and not in any one given year did we have enough money to meet the need of salmon and do all the projects available to us in the state of Washington. We typically fund about 20% of what's available. We need more resources, and I know it's a tough time to be thinking about that, given the COVID and the economic downturn, but salmon are gonna need more resources to protect and restore critical habitat, and we need you all there. And then finally, we just recently at our uh, Nisquadra Council retreat um, talked about adding our lovely town of DuPont, city of DuPont, to the Nisquadra Council. So we'd like to have a conversation with you and your fellow council members to have you join our family and be engaged in that way. So thank you for the question, I really appreciate it. A great question about how recreational use might impact recovery and how we balance those things. If people are swimming in pools behind engineered log jams or um, using spaces in the watershed for riding or um, biking or hiking, or um, how, how do we balance all of those objectives and what are the impacts? Hmm. I could, I could offer uh, one quick answer fairly quick answer to that. We're trying to, when the land trust does a salmon recovery project, the best of our ability, we try to make it a multi-use project. A good uh, example being the Bud Blanchard Trail in Eatonville, where we bought properties along the Michelle River, transferred them to the town of Eatonville, which then had raised funding to build the pedestrian bridge across the Michelle, the first bridge across the Michelle, and open up downtown Eatonville to over 40 miles of trails in Pack Forest. That's the way we encourage and encourage recreational use. Um, we have a big dream now is to be able to do the same thing on the main stem of the Nisqually River and extend the Yelm Prairie Line Trail across the Nisqually River for non-motorized use and connect it with the trail system in Pierce County, which would make the Yelm Roy area a regional hub for cyclists, hikers, and probably even horseback. Boy, what we really don't, what really hurts, and we, we're dealing with it today, you know, ATV use, for some reason, ATV use, there's a certain segment of the population, and I realize it's a small, small percentage, but a deadly one as far as we're concerned, believes that uh, their ATV use includes the right to knock down gates and play around on our properties, which just tears up the habitat, um, causes all kinds of problems. So we really encourage people to refrain from that and kindly but kindly and gently but firmly, if you see people doing it or talking about it, just try and talk them out of it. Um, we keep our properties open for uh, use. We have maps on our website. Uh, we don't build trails, um, but we don't prohibit people from using our properties, um, except uh, certain properties that are open for hunting uh, during the hunting season. We, well, we don't want hikers up there then. Um, I'll leave my response there. Anything to add to that, Chris or Joe? Chris or David, sorry. Chris, I would defer to you. Yeah, um, there's you know there's a time and place for all the recreation, and I think there's a interplay. We need to do a better job as the salmon um, managers to better inform the public um, around areas like Eatonville and the Lower Michelle River, where in the middle of August during a heat wave and a deep pool, which is exactly where everyone wants to swim there could be an ESA listed adult Chinook in there. 
that could get stressed out and and may not spawn successfully because people are swimming in there. And so I think, you know, we need to do a better job of informing the public about that um, during these low flow high, it's mostly a summertime thing. You get the rock dam building and that can really inhibit um, the ability of fish to move up and down and seek that cold water refuge that is becoming more and more scarce with um, climate change and some of the changes to the ecosystem that Joe was talking about in the upper Michelle. Um, so I think there's interplay there. I think there's a much, um, there's an education opportunity there because one of the things though that um, the highlights of public access and public property and is that it, has, it, it also creates an opportunity for a lot of restoration and a lot of education. And I think there is a crossroads there and we need, we could take better advantage of that, that interface um, for education. But I think we also generally, if you're a, if you're a citizen of the watershed, um, it's good to be aware that you could be swimming with endangered spe species at any time and, and to, to be aware of the conditions. Great, thank you. Uh, we've had a couple questions about getting involved. Uh, we know, uh, I mentioned at the beginning that we will have some opportunities for volunteers to come out and help with tree plantings in the fall. That'll be with social distancing and small groups. Um, other opportunities for folks in DuPont and all up and down the watershed, how can people help, uh, help be out there? Joe? Um, sure. Uh, from uh, for, for the Land Trust, keep an eye on our website. We will, as, as Emily said, there'll be opportunities to get out and do tree planting and, and habitat work um, as we can, uh, given the pandemic. Um, we really love volunteers. We count on them, but we've got to be really careful with them going forward. Um, like everybody at the Land Trust, we will be having a, a virtual auction <laughs> the week leading up to September 26th. Um, and uh, that's going to be our, uh, this will be our fundraising season. Like every, like all nonprofits, everybody's been hit by this thing. We're doing okay. We're stable, but we, our budget does count on our auction being uh, reasonably successful and our year end appeal campaign. If you can donate, that would be great. Our websites, nesqualilandtrust.org um, and keep an eye out. We'll, we'll open up business for volunteers and participation just as soon as we can. Meanwhile, we hope to be, bring, be bringing a number of these virtual webinars. And I think our next one will be on the community forest itself, a deep dive into what the community forest is. I think we have that scheduled for September 10th. Please join us. As David's saying, uh, and Chris is saying, education is a big part of it. David, you mentioned a couple other things like uh, communities can support funding at the local and state and federal level for uh, this kind of work. Are there other ways that people can can support this effort locally and and regionally? Yeah, I think that's really key is to have your voice be heard. Um, I know Representative Wilcox signed up and hopefully he's out there listening and I know he would agree that the people's voices matter and the electeds listen to what the priorities are coming out of their communities. And it's pretty rare that folks are filling up the phone lines in Olympia about salmon. And so salmon falls to the lower tier of funding priorities. I think if we had as much uh, enthusiasm for salmon as we do for schools, which I know is a challenge, and I have kids and we're enthusiastic about our schools, but that kind of level of voice would make a difference. And so this next legislative session is going to be incredibly difficult. And we're already expecting to have significant cuts on the operating side for the programs that support salmon recovery across Puget Sound um, and on the capital budget, which is the funds that we use to do a lot of our work on both sides. And so come January, when the session starts, we're going to need people down there talking to their elected officials saying salmon is important. We get we've got problems, but salmon's really important. Don't let them go away. And so reaching out now to your electeds and letting them know that it's a priority would be a good thing. And then showing up, there's going to be a Puget Sound Salmon Day on the Hill in uh, Olympia sometime in late January. It's being organized now by the Puget Sound Partnership, but that'll be an opportunity for the citizens to come down and have their voices be heard together with a lot of us who are practicing salmon recovery in the field. But getting active and writing letters and making phone calls is what it's all about. 
I'm going to combine a couple of things in this next question. Somebody's asking about the impacts of the 2020 Nisqually flood that happened earlier this year and how that is going to affect our salmon. I'm going to combine that with uh, maybe talk a little bit about climate change and the kind of extreme weather events that we may be seeing more of and what, what we can do to help make sure that our watershed's resilient to those for the fish and the rest of us. Okay. Chris, you want to tackle that one? Yeah. Yeah. Um... The most important thing we can do to build resilience in the system is to restore our forests and restore our floodplains and restore those areas that are the most dynamic in our system. And the forests um, are not resilient currently. And, and the Michelle River in particular is in a very um, sensitive uh, location. It's right in what we call the rain on snow event with kind of max elevations around like 4,500 feet. So in cold years, it can be snow and we get a nice trickle of water all through the spring and it can be pretty uh, good habitat. And then in warm system, warm, uh, warm years, it can be all rain, very flashy. And the way to moderate those changes and that those kind of um, disturbances is through mature intact forest. And that's just, uh, that's, and, and to remove as many roads as possible from the forest and to make it able to withstand those kind of um, disturbances. And then lower in the system are floodplains. Um, Joe showed those dramatic slides of the river eating away the bank, you know, on these big floods. Well, when a river, when we restore our floodplains and the river, the most amount of energy happens right before the river crests across the floodplain. And if we build dikes along the river, and if we don't permit that river to move laterally, then it just concentrates that energy through the main stem. And that's what can really destroy things like the salmon reds, those eggs in the gravel, um, like push the juveniles out too early and, and physically kill them in the river. If they don't have that kind of lateral floodplain habitat to retreat, so floodplains and forests, um, protecting and recovering those two, um, two elements are absolutely critical in order to build resiliency into the system. And then in terms of the 2020 flood that we experienced back in February, maybe I'll hit that one real quickly. It was an unfortunate perfect storm of events. We had a drought leading up to it, so our tributaries were very dry. We had our lowest chum return on record coming back to the Nisqually River, and they were forced to spawn in the Nisqually River because of the previous drought. And then whatever spawning they were able to do was likely significantly impacted by the flood. So I think as we look forward three and four years from now, as fish managers projecting run sizes, we're gonna have some critical runs coming back to the Nisqually that are probably not gonna support fisheries for the Nisqually tribe. It's gonna be a very devastating situation for us. Thank you. We have a couple questions left. A couple of them are on kind of really big meaty issues around regulation um, and zoning and, and land use like uh, recycled asphalt in the Nisqually Valley. Um, at, Develop warehouse development kind of stuff. I'm gonna make a plug here for the Nisqually River Council, which meets every month on the third Friday in the morning. We talk about a lot of those issues there. That is a great place to um, bring issues to the attention of all of the local governments um, and, and state and other entities that are working in the watershed. Um, I will make sure that everyone gets my contact info. If you're interested in learning about those meetings, I'm happy to put you on the list and you can also be in touch with me anytime if you've got concerns that you think would be good for that group to hear about. But um, it's a great way. We, we hear from um, all three of these awesome panelists every month at, at that River Council meeting, as well as lots of other topics and issues. So we would very much welcome uh, seeing any of you there. Um, I, as a lot, the final question that we have right now, um, because it was mentioned in the, the invitation to this event, um, what about the seals? What about the seals? What Chris about mentioned Salish Sea survival and, and what happens to fish as they're trying to migrate out. Who is getting them and, and what, what, what are we discussing in terms of how we can deal with that? Well, maybe I'll hit the political side and Chris can hit the biological side. The, the previous question about what can we do to help salmon 
And I responded in terms of salmon funding and being connected to your electeds. Also support the fact that we need to deal with some of these other issues that are really impacting our ability to restore salmon in the Nisqually and throughout Puget Sound. And in fact, uh, I think it's pretty clear that the fate of the Southern resident killer whale is also dependent on our ability to manage some of these other megafauna that are attractive with eyes that people like to give names to like Herschel the sea lion and cute seals balancing balls on their nose. Seals and sea lion populations are much larger than they've been historically and they're taking a huge bite, literal and figurative bite out of the salmon populations. And it's impacting us at Nisqually. We see that, Chris's presentation hit that with steelhead, um, but we're also seeing it hit other salmon and steelhead populations in Puget Sound. And they're, they're taking more, the seals and sea lions are taking more fish than we're catching and that whales are eating. And so the question that the public needs to address is if we, a choice between seals, which are at an incredibly haul time high or Southern resident killer whales, because they will not coexist. They are competing for the same food source and one of them is winning in a large way. And we are recommending, Chris and I have been working on for a while now, recommending management actions to try to get a handle on that population to control it, bring it more into balance so fish have a chance, Southern resident killer whales have a chance, and we have a chance to get some fish back to the river. And that would be my, my high level policy kind of answer, Chris. Yeah, all the, um, in the search for the, the answer to the decline of Puget Sound steelhead and why Puget Sound steelhead haven't rebounded from the collapse of the early 90s, a collapse which was most likely a more um, uh, large scale ocean event, um, but then the inability to for these populations to kind of climb back out um, has really been attributed, there's only uh, to predation. and um, harbor seals seem to be the number one culprit based off a lot of the diet work um, that we've been doing with a bunch of different partners. Um, so, so they're really hitting Puget Sound steelhead hard and the Squally steelhead in particular, given the, the Squally steelhead have to migrate the entire Puget Sound to get out to the Straits of Juan de Fuca. Um, another emerging issue that's happened over the last 15 years um, is is the migration of males, sub-adult males um, from rookeries in California of California sea lions, uh, as well as stellar sea lions. Um, and these big males now have become um, Puget Sound chum salmon specialists. They also hit our adult steelhead, which um, overlap in time and space. And uh, I encourage you to just have a jaw dropping sight is to go, if you have a boat or kayak, to the mouth of the Nisqually River in February. It's cold. And look at that barge, the old barge that's off of the wildlife refuge, off of the mudflats. And you will literally see 100, 200, one ton massive California sea lions hauled out on that barge. Those animals require a tremendous amount of food to eat, and their diet is almost entirely comprised of Puget Sound chum salmon um, and steelhead. The, they are new. This is a new phenomenon. Um, they're able to go all the way up our rivers and actually take fish off the spawning grounds. Um, I think an important perspective in all this is that this is the first time, since the Marine Mammal Protection Act, this is the first time these animals have never been hunted. For thousands and thousands of years, the tribes that lived on these rivers, they managed these populations. And so um, I think removing the human management piece um, has really impacted the, balance, the overall balance of the system. And um, our fish are getting hammered. And so um, we need to work on creative solutions. We're now working on, uh, on possibly testing some uh, sonic deterrence in the river during a certain amount of times um, to basically create a, a corridor of free passage for our juvenile steelhead that are being hit really hard by the local um, harbor seals in the Nisqually um, estuary. And we hope to be testing that within a couple of years to see if it's effective and 
at least for a small window, give these fish the ability to get um, more fish out. It's not a simple answer. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, thank you all so much again to our panelists for, uh, for taking the time to share this information. And thank you to all of you who were able to come and listen. We will make this presentation available over video and we'll send that information out. We will send out some information about the Nisqually River Council and upcoming volunteer opportunities and other events where you can get involved and stay in touch with us. Um, any final words or thoughts that, that you'd like to share before we take off? Um, maybe one last thought, and that is that uh, salmon recovery is very little about salmon, and it's really about people. And it's about people that are on this call and what you can do to be active and engaged in making this work. And it's about people that are coming to the region and how we educate them about being part of the ecosystem. If we can deal with the people issue and make us more compatible, the salmon will recover. They're amazing animals. We just need to get out of their way. And as Chris likes to say, take our foot off their throat. So it really is about people. So I'm glad we have a chance to connect with all of you because this is all about us. And uh, find ways to connect with us to help, help out in the cause would be great. Thank you so much. All Thank right, you. we're gonna wrap up um, and we'll be in touch. Take care, everybody. Thanks everybody. Thank you. Mahalo, everyone. Love you all. Take care. Good night. <laughs>